Welcome back to another episode at Shifting Schools and another episode in part of our mini series, all focused on SEL here to start the school year. Trisha, I know both of us were looking so forward to today's interview with uh, Katie and Dr. Rodriguez. Talk a little bit about uh, them, their background a little bit, and then we'll get into what, what we're going to hear today. Well, Dr. Katie Novak and Dr. Kristen Rodriguez have co-authored what Jeff, I know, like you, you hear me talk about books that I've loved and I hope the tenor in my voice was really distinct with this one because their new book in support of students, a leader's guide to equitable MTSS is just one of those, I think must have new books for professional mm -hmm. development uh, library. So for folks who are not familiar with them, Dr. Katie Novak is an educational consultant, author and graduate instructor at the university of Pennsylvania. She has over 20 years experience in teaching and administration and has published published 12 books focused on building inclusive and equitable classrooms, schools, and systems. Partnered on this text is Dr. Kristen Rodriguez, who spent over 20 years as a practitioner in private and public school settings, including being a teacher, principal, and superintendent of schools. Dr. Rodriguez is currently the owner of an educational consulting agency that helps provide professional learning and staffing to schools across the globe. In addition to her books, she has authored numerous MTSS implementation resources that have been used in the field. Listeners, in the show notes, you're going to find links to learn more about them as well as their book and a guide that's been put together for those of you who are thinking about getting a copy of the book and reading it together in a group. They've got a great supportive um, resource for you as well. Jeff, what do you think our listeners should be paying especially close attention to in our conversation? I know it's hard to pick one thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah right. One thing, try to get it down to one thing. Well, first of all, just the energy of both of them. Talk about people who are passionate about the work they do, passionate about education and supporting educators. I think that I, you can't help, I think, no matter where you're listening to this, come out of this feeling energized because their energy is off the charts. But I think for me, the, the thing that comes through is this idea that we are in the education profession and it is constantly changing. You know, there are a lot of analogies. If you like analogies, this is your episode. There's analogies from beginning to end, including you, Trisha, have some great analogies in this episode as well. But I think that idea of we're, we're never, we're never finished. There's there it's constant, there's constant change coming. And I love that, you know, their book is talking about MTSS. Uh, we focus a lot in this, uh, in this episode around MTSS or multiple tiered systems of support. And I think that comes through and understanding that this is something that we are constantly building. We are constantly changing. There is going to be constant change and how do we make sure that we're okay with that and we're supporting the people around us as we go through change management, which is a constant thing. It's not like, hey, we're going to go through change management and then we'll be done changing. <laughs> you go through change management and it's, it's constant. We are constantly evolving in education. And I think to me, that's something that comes through in this. And hopefully by the time you're done listening to this episode, you just feel a little bit better about yeah we live in a we live in a industry that will forever be constantly changing and and can we get to a place where we're, mentally we're we're good with that i guess how about you what what's the thing for you um i think for me it was the conversation around what we are doing in schools to really amplify the necessary message that we honor the profession of being an educator. How does that mm. come through in the professional development? How does that come through in meetings? And how does that come through in the books that you're picking for your professional development library shelf? Because, um, you know, as we get into in this episode, 
their book really does, I think, honor what it means to be an educator today. And I think mm. for folks who are picking the books that PLCs are going to dig into, you know, Dr. Novak has some advice for what you can do to really um, to honor variability for folks inside that book club. And I think it's those practices. If we want to see those practices in the classroom, we've got to see them throughout our professional development. So um, that really stuck out to me. But uh, I I'm really hoping listeners enjoy this episode. It was amazing learning more from Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Novak. And um, again, really talking about, I think it's a great episode towards the start of the year. How do we honor one another as educators? How do we make mm -hmm. sure that we are really recognizing the complexities of what it means to be working in education in 2023? Yeah. And if you're ready, be ready for an upbeat episode, because again, they both just, uh, their energy is contagious. And uh, hopefully that comes through in the audio version as much as it does the video version. By the way, if you haven't heard, we do now have video podcasts over on YouTube. You can search for Shifting Schools videos. So if you do want to see the video, uh, because it, I mean, you can only imagine if you're listening to the audio version, how animated they are in the video version as well of this. So you might want to head over to YouTube if you haven't already uh, found us over there. We do now have video products uh, available of all of our episodes. So you can actually see us too. And I don't know why you would, it's all conversation, but some people, I guess, like uh, to see you as you're going. But uh, yeah, we're very excited about this episode. This is great. And with that, here is Dr. Novak and Dr. Rodriguez with their new book, In Support of Students, A Leader's Guide to Equitable MTSS. I hope you enjoy this conversation. And with that, on with the show. Dr. Novak, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for being here. Your brand new book, In Support of Students, A Leader's Guide to Equitable MTSS, starts off by grounding the reader in considering how it is that we go about navigating change. I'm wondering if you might speak to that design choice and why that felt important to really just set the foundation for the rest of the book. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that we have learned is that, gosh darn it, change is hard. Change is really, really hard for people. And too often we talk about what needs to change and why it needs to change. And we don't really delve into how to actually make those changes happen. It's like hope is not a strategy. And there's a whole science behind change. There's a whole science behind how do we really manage this complex change and carry people along with us because we're really always being torn in these two directions. One, trying to make everyone around us feel comfortable and good and celebrated for the work we're doing. And at the same time, we're like, yeah, but that's not quite enough because we have to do something different. And so how do we do that and really maintain the humanity of all of the people who are doing this work, who are doing the best with what they have? And you know, one funny story is... Recently, I learned for all the listeners, everyone's going to go, oh my goodness, how did you not know that? But uh, last August, my husband and I went on vacation and we were in a rental car and we pulled up to a gas station and I pulled over and got out of the car and walked around the car and my husband's like, oh my word, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just looking for where the gas tank is. And he's like, I can't tell if that's a joke or if you're serious. <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? Why? Like, it, of course it's serious. We need gas. And he's like, Katie, there is like a little tiny icon on your gas gauge that tells you what side the gas tank is on. And I'm like, no, there's not. And he's like, oh my goodness. Yes, there is. It's a triangle. Look at the gas gauge. I'm like, oh, is this on every car? And he's like, oh my goodness. Yep. Like since we were 16, it's been like 30 years at least. And turns out every car I've been in since has had this little triangle. And so this is a ridiculous story. And why am I starting here? It's because I honestly felt really dumb for not knowing. Like, mm -hmm. and of course we were laughing about it and it's not that big of a deal because I don't like identify proudly as a driver. But for me, it was really hard to know that there was something I could have been doing so much more efficiently and so much better. And I didn't know. And there's this grief and there's this loss in that. And I always tell that story because it's very easy to make fun of. Some people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you didn't know. And there's always a handful who are like, you've changed my life. This is the best thing I've ever learned. <laughs> so if finding out that there's a little tiny 
arrow in your gas gauge makes you feel bad, what about the way we've been scheduling students, the way we've been designing our faculty meetings, the way that we've been pouring ourselves into our life's work in the classroom? It's not what's best for students. And you have to deal with the loss of that a little bit. And so Kristen and I have worked together for years trying to navigate this change. And how do you help people recognize that once we know better, we're going to do better, but we also have to support our educators, our families, our students in doing that. So Kristen, talk a little bit about like how you see change. Yeah, so for for us, I always use the analogy, two analogies I use when it comes to change. One is, are we being explicit and systematic in the way we make change within our organizations, within our schools, within our districts? And if not, it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping it sticks. We're working really hard, but there's really not a lot of positive outcomes for all of that hard work, which just produces a lot of frustration. So that there is science behind change and organizational change and implementation change. And we need to make sure that we're very thoughtful about creating those systems of change prior to implementing anything, prior to even beginning. Like, let's recognize that there is a way that we should be doing this that's going to result in the pasta sticking and not just hoping it will. And the No one other, wants spaghetti on the floor. Nobody wants spaghetti from the floor. <laughs> no. No wall, if I'm going to be honest, but still, um, <laughs> right? So the, the other thing is, I always say, if I'm going to go into your school, am I going to see the same level of implementation across all classrooms? In other words, do I have carte blanche to walk into any classroom? Generally, what we hear is, no, no, no. Why don't you walk into this classroom? Why don't you walk into this classroom? And that really means that we have different levels of implementation. And I call that the rain not hitting the ground. We might get a big group of educators who could speak the speak and talk about the systemic level of change, but not everybody is. And so it's really important that as we think about this change, that not only are we understanding the process that needs to take place, but that we're being very thoughtful and reflective about who we engage in the onset of the design of this work so that the rain hits the ground no matter which environment we walk through. Hmm. Right. You don't want people who have been told about this little arrow being like, I don't care what you said about that arrow. I'm getting out and I'm walking <laughs> around, the around the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such a great point. And I think we see this. I mean, I love your just, you know, uh, coming out of classrooms, going into a school where as a consultant myself, they're like, yeah, well, we, we've set up this classroom for you to see today. <laughs> this teacher uh, has said it's okay to come into this classroom. And it is, it's a telltale sign of, you know, how distributed is the change that you are trying to make within your organization. I think that's such a great, just a, a, even for a principal or school leader who might be, you know, listening to this episode to be thinking about if, somebody, if a consultant walks in, do, do I, can I say, walk into any classroom and this is what you're going to see? Or are we struggling with maybe change management across the entire school district organization, whatever it might be? So uh, I, th I think that's a, a really good lens for people to kind of think through it and think about. And I, I kind of appreciate yeah. you answering too, right off the bat with an anecdote, because I really appreciated how that was sprinkled throughout the text, right? Stories. One of you mm -hmm. used the term humanizing. And I think that's an ingredient that's often missing from professional development books. Um, you know, I just kind of wanted to comment that I, what I really appreciated with you leading with change and not suggesting change is easy is because that feels so relevant right now. Um, you know, educators mm -hmm. have been asked to change at an increasingly like just exponential breakneck pace. Um, and you, you took, you know, an often used sort of uh, reflection reframe that I used to think, but now I think, and I love that you added on to it. And in the future, I might think that just, you know, again, sort of reminds us that we're always going to be in this state of flux. And I feel like it's a difficult thing to accept, but it's also necessary. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that it's easy. So I just, I thought that was such a nice kind of homage to educators to say, we get it. We have always been evolving. We're going to continue to do so. It's hard, but also when we're really compassionate and strategic, that change piece can be done um, more compassionately. I, I really, really appreciated that about the book. And how much of well, that is also have you found in your work that really it's a mindset, right? It's the it's the where have I been? 
where am I going? But that future piece is a mindset for educators to be thinking about as much as we would love for everything to stop and for me to just teach the same curriculum over and over and over. That's not going to happen. Curriculum adoptions keep coming. New resources keep coming. New things keep coming. Like it doesn't matter, right? The, this thing continues to evolve down the road. How much of it do you find is, is working with educators just around the mindset of being okay that it's going to continually change? And I mean, I think it, it comes down to, you know, number one, I, I don't think this is for like a, a, you know, for lack of, of wanting it, you know, Kristen tells this great story, like at the very, very beginning of the book, it's, uh, you know, you wanted to go to this Island and it's like, I am, I want to go there. Tell us, tell us about that story, Kristen. Cause once you tell it, I want to add on to it and talk about how it relates to that. Like, how do we help educators kind of shift that mindset as well? Absolutely. So, um, I live in, um, in Puerto Rico and right outside my window is this beautiful ocean view. And uh, there's this this wonderful island uh, called, there's two islands that I can see from my window, Vieques and Culebra. And both of these islands are ripe for exploration and I can see it. However, I've never, <laughs> I know it's there. I know how to get there. I know how to get on a ferry and get over there. And yet I just, I haven't done it. I haven't done it because I haven't prioritized it. I haven't really organized my life in a way that mm. I uh, allow myself that that free time to do it. And so it just becomes this just vision of what I want to happen. Uh, and um, it's really as simple as me understanding that I need to take the time to create those mm. steps. I need to create some vacation time. I need to book through the online travel. So again, it's it, it's it, it doesn't need to always be a vision, right? There's a simple path there if we just give ourselves the the, the grace to to, mm. to 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 do it. You know, and so like building on that story, I think a lot of the times when people talk about mindset, it's like, but what about people who are resistant? And mm. we we don't face a lot of people who are resistant. We face people who are like, I'm just so overwhelmed. <laughs> I am fatigued. It's like demoralizing. I have nothing left to give. And like, I, I, I want to do it. Like, we are working way too hard to not have better results for all kids. People mm -hmm. want to have an impact on kids. And I think it's the same thing. It's like, I see it and I want to do it. I've experienced it in professional learning. I understand kind of theoretically, these are the steps that I would need to take, but sure. it's like, Oh, it's just so hard to like kind of change the comfort zone. And so one of the things that I try to do to talk about, like, you know, everything you're doing right now, once you weren't doing it yet. And so like, we're, you know, there's things that we can do already. There's things we've done already and there's things we haven't did, done yet. And I think that in so many spaces in our life, we totally understand that. And so, you know, I always, you know, talk about like technology, for example, where people are like, oh, change is hard. I don't want change. And I'm like, I get it. Like I was such a resistor for moving from like PowerPoint to Google slides. But then when Canva came out, I'm like, no, do not come from my Google slides. Right. And then it was like really hard to say, like, there might be something that will work better. And so I always say, like, take out your how many of you have an iPhone? And, you know, a lot of people, you know, you have your Android people, you have your iPhone people, right? You have your holdouts who have the flip phone. That's amazing. But if I say, like, who has the iPhone one, mm. two, three, like, your holdouts might be on an eight, but they're not on a one. And so when we talk about this diffusion of innovation, like there are some people who are like, yes, I'm going to make the change. And they become like an amazing demonstration of impact to say mm. it's possible. So, you know, Kristen, if one of your friends, your best friends in Puerto Rico makes the trip and is like, oh my goodness, I love it. I'm going next Wednesday. Will you come? You'd be like, you know what? I'm going to get on my golf cart. I'm going to go down to like the ferry. I'm going to get on there. But like this vicarious experience, this demonstration of impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes we're expecting everyone to move at the same pace. And you're not going to go from the iPhone 8 to the iPhone 14 maybe, but like how do we move forward recognizing mm -hmm. that there's no ceiling, there's no end. And so I use a lot of analogies to say, if you think back to your teaching from 10 years ago, it looks different. 
And so to say, you know, gosh, this is what I've been doing forever. That's not true. You used to have like the easy grader. Remember that amazing easy grader, everyone that you slid the cardboard and it's like, you're not doing that anymore. So you are somebody who embraces change. And so how do we help you support you through that? Mm -hmm. And one of the, the rationales for using that particular analogy was the concept of agency within mm. that analogy, that it was not contingent necessarily on others to make change, to allow me to do that. Mm. It was what were the steps that I had to make in my own life, in, in this case, in our own practice, uh, that we don't have to wait for others to approve. And so, you know, not only just kind of knowing how to, to make those steps, but, but, but giving our staff and our organizations uh, levels of agency so that they can make those steps along with the organization. Mm-hmm. Well, you've set us up perfectly that. for the, the next question, which I won't steal from yeah. you, Jeff, but I wanted to point out, I, I think when it, uh, you know, what you said, Katie, about Kristen making the trip and how it becomes easier with a friend, I feel like your book has actually been written for groups to discuss too. And I love that there are so many analogies throughout because I feel like that's where educator conversations can really dig into like nuance and ask better questions. So sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to like cut no, in front of the next I was going to say it's a perfect question, lead in, yes. you know, uh, but we were hoping that you would maybe again on this idea of just using analogies, uh, you use a, an analogy in the chapter where you're defining what MTSS is and the analogy is baking, not caking. Uh, <laughs> can maybe you talk a little bit about that analogy? Okay, I can, but I have to do a quick little pause here because I have to know what everyone's favorite cake is because I like really want to personalize the story. So, uh, Trisha, you first. What's your favorite cake? Red velvet, which I feel like maybe Ooh. is more technically a cupcake, but I'm going to stand behind that answer. No, I think it's just a form of food coloring. So I think you're... <laughs> <laughs> Just chocolate cake with white frosting for me. Just simple. Oh, plain. oh I like yeah. it. Classic. Yeah. Okay, Classic, Kristen. Yeah. Oh, Funfetti. Does that tell you something about it? Oh! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fun Betty. Okay, right. I'm not so, grown up ever. <laughs> we think about like, okay, so like we want to make a cake. We want to bake a cake, right? Trisha wants to make a red velvet cake. But you don't cake. And for the love of all that's good, so many people will say, oh, like we already, like we already do MTSS. And I'm like, First of all, it's not something you do. Like MTS is not a verb. You don't MTSS, right? You are (laughs) building a system that better supports leaders and families and educators and students. And so like you're building this system, you're baking this cake. And so a lot of the times when we're talking to teams, we're like, okay, so you have to remember MTSS is not a verb. And so a lot of you who are listening might say, oh my gosh, I, I kind of do that. Yeah, we're already doing MTSS. But it's really about we are designing deeper learning experiences. We are providing high quality professional development. We are adopting high quality instructional resources. We are using data authentically and deliberately and meaningfully so that we can best meet the needs of students where we are and bring them to where they're going. And all of those actions are essentially the different ingredients, the things that we have to do so that we can build a multi-tiered system. So we like to talk about like the recipe for MTSS. What are all the different things you need? Really high quality staff, high quality instructional materials, time for collaboration, all of those things. And then what do you do with all of that? And Mm -hmm. so we create a recipe for MTSS and it just provides a way to kind of personalize and make it more authentic that most people are very familiar with what is a recipe. And if you get a recipe for like this really complex homemade funfetti cake, then you might say, oh, I'm going to have to go to the store. Some of these ingredients I don't have yet. Mm-hmm. And the same is true when we do a MTSS self-assessment, which is like, if you're trying to build a system that works for everyone, what ingredients do you have already? What ingredients do you have yet? And what we often find is like, well, that person has that in the pantry, but the other person doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so how do we kind of create more equitable distribution of all of these really important resources so that we can truly serve all of our learners? So, you know, Kristen, you do an amazing job with this planning piece. We work with teams all over the world and we'll do a self-assessment and teams will say, okay, this is what we have partially in place. This is what we don't have in place yet. And this is what we have mostly in place. And then they go, well, now what? 
And then Kristen yeah. comes in, boom, jackhammer. And, you know, talk a little bit about like, once you recognize what you have and what you don't have, what does that planning piece look like? Well, first of all, to make a, a vanilla cake funfetti, it's literally just sprinkles, right? That's all it is. I don't know if anyone knows that. But what if you had to make the sprinkles though? Right. What, I right. mean, <laughs> we're talking. Yeah, I know. Right? Woman. Woman. Make it make it more difficult for me. But honestly, sometimes it's simple and it feels challenging and it feels difficult and it's quite simple. And then sometimes you have to make the sprinkles and it's really challenging, right? And so I, I think part of the workaround systems change is identifying a few key levers that we can pull, a few key recipes that we can make available to this particular district that is lacking that with those few, we can make something really amazing that everybody will um, benefit from. And mm -hmm. so these key levers that we've talked about, you know, the, the, in its most simplistic forms is, are, are we using high quality instruction materials with our students um, that are aligned to standards that have equitable access that are culturally sustaining in the way that we um, manage our instruction? Are we using effective instructional practices? Are we using data in ways that inform both our systemic shifts and changes as well as within our classroom settings? And are we offering tiered support so everyone gets what they need, right? It's as simple as four key ingredients within that recipe, mm -hmm. though how that looks, the specific spices we use, the particular, um, you know, uh, levels to which we need to, to, to adjust for within that recipe are, do need to be personalized to the particular organization and setting, but ultimately there's a few key things. And that's really what the book surfaces is, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be, um, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be guessing. You don't have to guess at what those things are. We know what those key things are that will affect change. How do we bring that down in a personal way? That's why we created that self-assessment. What aspects of these key levers do you have? And it becomes much more explicit, much more simple. Uh, then we look and say, do we have sprinkles in our cabinet or not, right? Uh, if we know that we need sprinkles. So um, uh, I think I think that's really the intent behind the book was to take something very complex uh, and, and, and not oversimplify it, but mm. let people know that there's some core concepts and core components of that recipe that, that we can all um, fold in. I love that analogy. And, you know, I, I think you're both pointing to just how practical the book is. And it is for community in kind of a meta way, like as you're describing, this is a great book for teams to be working through together within a school, but it's also a book that is meant for the school community itself. We wanted to invite you to discuss this book as part of our mini series on social emotional learning. And I wanted to highlight just how much this book does to really consider the social emotional learning of educators too, a conversation that I would love to see more of. The book guides leaders to truly think about the ways in which teachers can experience belonging in schools. And I want to do the weird thing of quoting your own work back to you. This comes specifically from page 79, where you write, quote, we cannot serve all students until we design learning that embraces the brilliance and lived experiences and identities of our black and brown students learners with disabilities, multilingual learners, students who are economically disadvantaged, LGBTQ students, students who experience trauma, and students who need more social, emotional, behavioral, or academic support than we currently provide, end quote. With the emphasis on reflection that comes really throughout the book, I really feel that you've positioned social emotional skills as a priority for today's school leader. And I'm wondering, as I've gone through this very lengthy question, um, does that seem accurate to you? Was that something that was in your minds or is that just kind of kind of a, a lucky byproduct um, of of the reading experience, would you say? And feel free to be like, nope. Totally wrong, Trisha. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, <laughs> but thanks for the long totally question. Totally spot on. <laughs> totally spot on. Um, when we really uh, reconceptualized the concept of um, MTSS a few years back in one of our original iterations of, of a multi tier system of support back in around 2012, uh, what we really wanted to do was make sure that the domains, the domain of behavioral, social, emotional, and academic supports were equal in nature and were balanced. Mm. It's not one against the other, it's not one in pursuit of the other. All three have equal importance in the work we do. And so you picked up on that 
So I really appreciate hearing hearing you pick up on that, which is fantastic. One of the things that um, we really want to make sure that we do is really understand the the importance and value of engagement and um, this concept of belongingness, this concept of seeing ourselves in 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 our environment, in the texts that we read, uh, in the conversations that we explore, are a key component of belonging, which really activates the affective network of the brain to support concepts of engagement. And that is not developmental; that occurs across all levels, including for our adults. And so, at, we need to make sure that we are creating spaces that feel comfortable, that feel reflective that are, feel authentic, that engage in relevant um, pursuit of our educational goals, which is a core component of deeper learning, core component of universal design for learning, core component of uh, thoughtful systems within our schools. And so I'm really excited that you you talked about that. I was just meeting with a group of administrators and principals today, and we were really thinking about components of data and how do we know we were successful and we were pairing the academic components with those components of do I have a sense of belonging? How are we engaging our students and giving a voice about how they feel that they are, what they're getting out of their own um uh, experiences within our school? Do they feel like they belong? Same kinds of questions we ask our staff as well. So um, thank you for picking up on that. And uh, it was intentional. And, you know, I think uh, it, it really shouldn't be, and I think this happens all the time. So I'm going to say it one more time. I think I alluded to it. It really shouldn't be social, emotional, and pursuit of academic, right? We're only mm -hmm. doing this so we can increase our test scores. We really want to make sure that our students are feeling that, that, that they belong within that, um, setting that they are valued and they are an asset. They are all an asset. They all bring assets to our organization. So how do we make ourselves better by tapping into those assets? And I'll let Katie um, talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Like I, I always see all of them as like completely braided intertwined. You can't take them apart. Like all learning is social and emotional because all learning requires self-awareness, requires perspective taking, opening your mind, involves responsible decision making. And we cannot get the best out of the people we serve if we can't like look at them and say, you get to be exactly who you are and you will be successful here. And I love the work of Chris Emden, who says that, you know, his definition of equity is hearing someone's voice about what they need and providing them with that. And so how do we give a space for families to say what they need, for educators to say what they need, for students to say what they need? And historically, you know, people were creating strategic plans in a central office with one or two people making decisions for like the masses and public education is not dictation. <laughs> like we are literally working together to build something that represents us as a community that really elevates and celebrates all of our different perspectives and honors the humanity of every single individual. And I think that that is some of the most beautiful, beautiful work that's come out of these really big shifts in education is that we cannot simply look at schools for their test scores and determine the quality of the experience they provide to the community, to the hearts and minds of educators and, you know, parents and, and family members and guardians. And so when we look at that as a part of the vision that we exist to help people recognize who they are, to set really meaningful goals for their future, and to really help them to be best prepared to be able to pursue that, whatever that is, we have all of these visions about this dynamic, deeper learning, everyone's included. And then you look in the classroom and it's like, <laughs> it's like what we are doing in this classroom is going to prevent students from really becoming great communicators because we're not modeling what it means to listen. We're not allowing people to be responsible decision makers when all tasks are based on compliance. And I was looking at a quote the other day, which was so beautiful, which was, you know, artificial intelligence is not going to take your job. Someone using artificial intelligence is going to take your job. And it's, the critical thinking necessary to be successful in this world requires that we significantly change the classroom experience to value 
that reflection, that brainstorming, that innovation to allow students to play with and use tools because this is the world in which we exist. You know, academics is not in any way in a silo. And what Kristen and I do you know, mostly is we don't work with students very much anymore, um, which is heartbreaking to my soul, but we do support the people who serve them. And the same is true for educators is we can not shift education with stand and deliver snooze fest professional development. And I will fully embrace that I used to provide snooze fest professional development. There is no judgment here, but we have to model in professional learning what we want to see in classrooms and allow educators to have the same opportunities to self-reflect, to, in, you know, to try and to fail forward and, and to continually grow because this compliance environment is not serving anyone. And so, you know, Kristen, we talk a lot about like what's different between traditional education and true deeper learning. And it's like kind of those three pillars of the mastery of the goals that we set forward academically, behaviorally, socially, and emotionally, building your true identity as a writer, as a scholar, as a community member. You're not a student, right? You're not learning about writing, you're a writer. And then that last piece of building that creativity of like, how do we exist in a world with artificial intelligence and VR and all of that? And Kristen, that's, you know, definitely your area of expertise there. But, you know, how do we kind of shift education? So this core of the human experience of being a learner is not to be a vessel of which Mm. someone just pours into you. So Kristen, talk a little bit more about deeper learning, because I think it's just so interesting, especially in its intersection with like that artificial intelligence, the advances in technology piece. And I think, you know, it actually begins at the administrative and leadership level. So Kitty talked about, you know, how sad it is that we're going to do a stand and deliver and talk about, you know, engaging classroom instruction, and we're not doing that through professional development. Same thing with the leadership roles beyond just professional learning. How we conduct ourselves as educational leaders is a model for what we would like to see within the classrooms to which we oversee, supervise, and support. And so we are in service of our staff as they are in service of the students. And so it's really important that we make sure that as we kind of design mechanisms from change and for change, uh, we are modeling what we would like to see happen in our classrooms, whether that be, um, I was just talking to a group of administrators earlier today about the use of artificial intelligence as a mechanism to make ourselves more accessible to classrooms. Why are we still from scratch, writing little newspaper blurbs and things like that about something that can be done um, very quickly and easily in that we would give the ideas and generate the thing, create a prompt for a uh, an email blurb that goes out. We have generative AI right now that can can give an overview of the initiative that we're doing so we can get that. And you know what? Instead of doing that, we can make ourselves available to be in the classrooms, interacting with um, the students and interacting with the educators. We can put our scheduling onto Calendly so we don't have to spend a minute creating a Zoom link and, uh, you know, um, uh, creating uh, a meeting invitation and uh, a doodle and all of those other things that take time so we can be invested in changing systems and reviewing uh, the language of our policies and procedural manuals to make sure that they are equitable and they have access for all of our students. So mm-hmm. how can we use tools and, and, and include and encourage our staff access tools? How do we uh, make sure that, that we are uh, modeling the use of, of AI as, again, as a tool, as opposed to something that's going to replace the work. It replaces the kinds of tasks we don't want to be doing so we can engage in the tasks that we do want to be doing. And the similar kinds of translation software, speech to text that are helpful to our students can also be helpful to community members, can also be helpful to staff. So again, it's using it as a tool so mm-hmm. that we can invest more in direct interaction. And I love that. There is so much to unpack in everything you said. I'm sitting here taking notes so I can touch on a lot of these. But I want to start with your last piece, right? Um, And where we are right now with AI. Of course, coming into this school year, we know that this school year is going to be a lot about AI. And, you know, I am just, by the time this thing is, by the time this airs, I'll have just done uh, 38 different districts around ChatGPT. And one of our first, one of the first concerns is, well, how do we keep kids from plagiarizing? I'm like, whoa, 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 let's back up. And what if I can save you four to six hours a week 
doing the tasks that you have to do anyways, but this thing will do them in seconds. And my first question to teachers is, what would you do with an extra four hours in front of kids where you didn't have to be behind a computer, right? You didn't have to be behind a computer. You can be with your kids. How does that change the relationship? Because I can get you out from behind the computer because we can make any lesson plan based on any standard in UDL format in under 30 seconds. Right. Now, is it perfect? No, but it's something you didn't have 30 seconds ago. And then you sit down as a team and you take the best of what AI has to offer and you create something that's you know, out of this world for you and your students. I, I agree with you. I think there's so much there that we need to utilize on that end. The other end though, I want to go back and start with kind of where Katie started with. And I think this idea of how much buy-in do you have at the beginning is really interesting. I'll never forget one of the first times I was like the second or third school I was uh, teaching at. And I remember, you know, the superintendent did the beginning of the year kickoff and set the agenda for the year. And I'm sitting next to my friends and nobody knew what was coming. You know, this idea of like how much buy-in does the community have when the superintendent says, oh, this year we're focused on X, Y, and Z and everybody around is going, we, we are? Like we don't, there, there was no buy-in. It wasn't, nobody knew this was coming. And instantly, what did that do to us as educators? We were like, wait a minute. How do you know that's what I need? How do you know that's what our community needs? You know, where did, you know, this decisions getting made in some back room somewhere up in higher, you know, at district office is all of a sudden, and it automatically puts you into a place of, well, really, really, that's what you think our focus should be this year. And I think that's, it's a critical piece, you know, especially as this is coming out in September around these ideas of how much buy-in do you make sure as a classroom teacher, how much are you listening to your students as a school principal? How much are you listening to your community? And then again, you know, you head up the to central office. How much are you listening to the community at large as well? The other part I, I love that you were touching on is even how much the way we deliver professional development impacts what we want to see in the classroom and the stand and deliver. And Trisha and I have created this thing called the Sunrise Framework that supports coaches and instructional leaders in creating sessions that aren't stand and deliver professional development sessions. And it's fantastic. I've been working with a district and I was sitting down with one, <laughs> with one of these instructional coaches just uh, yesterday. I was, I was sitting with a couple of them and they were giving me feedback on stuff. And one of them was saying, well, where in this framework do I just tell them? And I'm like, <laughs> nowhere, <laughs> nowhere in the framework do you just get to tell them <laughs> that's, that's not how this works. Right. And, but that was, they're just like, they were really struggling with how do I do professional development where I just don't like, why can't I just tell them what I want them to know? Like, well, because that's not what we want them to do in the classroom. And that's not what good learning is, <laughs> you know? And so you're going to have to, and, and it's, you know, it's a switch for all of us. You know, it's a switch at the classroom level. It's, it's a switch at the instructional level as well of just because you told somebody something doesn't mean learning occurred. And I think that is something to get over or something for us to remember, right? Just because I told you something doesn't mean learning occurred. And so how are we creating these situations uh, where we are actually, implementing what we know is good teaching and learning strategies and, uh, you know, at all levels of the institute. Well, I think it also uh, gets to Trisha. like what you're talking about kind of more broadly in seeing your school, not from this deficit mindset that, you know, mm -hmm. we all have to go and fix one another, but seeing one another as assets and seeing our community is something that is going to be a good place for us to want to be and learn in. You know, I, I am thinking maybe, you know, Katie, you're phrasing the snooze fest PD. Investors, if you're listening, let's turn that into a radio station for people that can't sleep at night. Like, I feel like there might be a market for that. Um, but, you know, I think also, you know, to some of your really important questions about, you know, whether or not we are implementing certain things or well, whether or not we are listening to our community it can be easy for someone to dismiss that question and be like, we are, end of story. But what I love about all of the pause and reflect questions in the book is you offer some friction, right? If yes, give examples. Like I feel like you're never letting anybody out of the question with just a one word answer. It really is like, let's look for the anecdotal evidence. And I think that's really important too. So um, I, I wonder in closing, if you want to talk a little bit about for our listeners who are excited to pick up a copy of the book and be discussing it with their teams, do you have any advice for some of the 
collective readership that I'm guessing is going to be happening, like for folks who are saying, let's read this together as a team. Let's put a PLC together. Um, any thoughts on what might make for a really great collaborative experience? Well, we so, do have a guide that um, that a member of the Novak organization put together. Katie, do you want to introduce that? Because that is a resource that I'm sure you can link that will help facilitate those conversations. That was not going to be my contribution, but I love it. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is, um, you know, I... I am so, so, so passionate about universal design, which mm. is really honoring the learner by thinking about firm goals, flexible means. So the first thing is if you're going to do a book study and the firm goal is we're going to have a shared reading experience, provide everyone with the option. Do you want a copy of the printed book? Do you want to access the ebook? Do you want to have an audible copy of the book? So I think like right from the get go, just honoring that variability. And then I think, you know, with the, the discussion questions throughout the book, um, I actually did this yesterday with a group and it was so interesting. Whereas I'm like, okay, so these are the questions and like the firm goal here, right. Is that you kind of reflect on, and then you're ready to collaborate around those questions. And so I provided you with some options. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the barriers that I, you know, um, predicted, but I'm sure I didn't get them all. So like, let's kind of create this together. And I said, so, um, you know, when you're answering this question, like start off, with someone else. So you can choose to work with a partner. You can choose to work with a small group. And, you know, I know that some of you are going to be super comfy in here because it's 113 degrees in Tucson. And, and so some of you might want to just sit here and have a conversation, but we're in like a beautiful hotel space. So some of you might want to go outside or there's a Starbucks, Starbucks upstairs. You can walk over there or, you know, goodness knows you're all from Tucson. So I'm going to give you, you know, 15 minutes to have a conversation. And, you know, if the best way for you to have that conversation is to maybe get in your car and like, you know, you have to pick up a prescription and people were like, wait, you're going to let us go outside. I'm like, what? Of course you can go outside. Like you are highly trained, brilliant professionals. But I think so often it's like, here's the book club. You're in this room at this time, a hard copy for everyone. We're going to spend four minutes on each question. Let's sit here and talk. And it's like, are we really honoring, like school is opening next week. People are really busy. You can have a conversation while you go and drop off something in a building. And it was just, people were like, it was just, thank you. Mm. Like, mm. thank you for letting us get a coffee. And I'm like, this is sad that like, again, these are brilliant people. And it's like, I think that we're so used to being a cog in this machine of learning that it's just so beautifully humanizing when someone sees you, when someone recognizes that like, there's lots of different ways to access this text and there's lots of different ways to discuss this text, whether it is in a conversation, whether it's in a chat online and Twitter. And I think just asking people like what would be the best, most productive way space, you know, you could have a group who has discussions in Spanish. You could have a group that has discussions in English. You could have a group that just has their discussions online because it's better for them on their drive home to do it. And I think that that is, is the kind of the most important thing is that how can you model the flexibility and the humanity of universal design as you're having a, a shared reading experience about something mm -hmm. that is incredibly important for mm -hmm. you to build the system that you want to build because we're not doing it already because it's not something to do and be done. It's mm -hmm. just so, as we continue in this work. So Katie is, is, is really theoretical, conceptual, and inspiring, and I'm super practical, and that's why we work well together. So um, if, you, if you are looking for a scaffold, if you are looking, like we, we like the book, but nobody wants to have to pre-read the book and come up with an implementation guide for the PLC to have this discussion, we actually did create one for you. So you can um, think about creating one on your own, something that really relates to your particular organization, or just take this free resource and have that be the driver because we didn't want any barriers to mm. folks to kind of talk about this collaboratively. So we thought if we create some level of a construct of a scaffold for folks and that would allow that 
um, discussion. And I'm going to go even one more. I'm gonna, Jeff, I'm going back to what you were talking about, which is how do we kind of think about the use of artificial intelligence mm. to free up the time to have yeah. these kinds of conversations, right? I mean, okay. at this point, if you're looking at scheduling, why are you not putting in some of those, con- you know, conundrums into generative AI like chat GPT? How could I create a schedule that does this? Use something like Descendo Zen, because often when we create a schedule for a school, we are creating at the beginning of the, you know, for the beginning of the year, we do not revisit that schedule. Whoa, we can't talk schedules. Year's already it's begun. Set. It's, it's set. set. <laughs> so how are we providing kind of that flexibility within a multi-tiered system if we are inflexible in our time once that school year has begun? So using AI to kind of, um, to support some of those processes. If you're thinking about um, uh, creating access um, within the school, use some of the resources that are available to us, like uh, SimboTalk for uh, communication boards for kids, Speechify, text-to-speech, right? All of these things that um, we can utilize within our framework. What we would say is do not just give the tool and say, here it is. Vet the tool. Make sure you have policies and practices that make that feel safe, that we're not giving any um, important information about our kiddos out there that we shouldn't be using. Give them time to play and practice it, but give them access. That um, I'm thinking, Jeff, that you were talking about the essay. Why not use my essay AI? right? It reads the essay and gives feedback. Why, you know, that doesn't mean that you're not valuable. It means that there are tasks that the AI can do so that you can work with a small group of kiddos right. at a specific now I'm working, uh, now topic I'm spending area. more time one-on-one with kids. That's what we want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I would say take advantage of the tools that are out there to, to put the, the, the time into this work, which is deep work that we're talking about in this book. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And I think there's just, there's so many ways, you know, and and, I mean, we're all about AI over here at Shifting School. So everybody knows this already, but I'm working with a district right now that just sent me, I don't even know how big the spreadsheet is, but it's their transportation. It's their transportation stuff. And we're going through it using AI, using the code interpreter and chat GPT. And we've already found that it is predicting when the bus's oils will need changed. So they're already setting a schedule based on how many miles that they know the buses are going to drive based on the schedules that, and nobody had to spend, it literally took chat GPT less than two minutes to tell us every bus, where it's going to be, when's it going to need an oil change. And they can start scheduling that stuff out. That's somebody's time. (laughs) They now have time to actually go do other things because we know we've already got that, that that's done, right? You don't need to dig through the data to figure out when this stuff is going to happen. There's a lot of ways that we can use this. That's just one simple thing. But again, even in the transportation department at schools, we're saving time so you can be doing something else, right? And I think that when we talk about technology, how does it get me as an educator back in front of my kids? That's what I want. Whether it's small group instruction or I'm spending more time one-on-one with those kiddos, I want to leverage technology so that I'm back with my kiddos. That That is should be the focus of when we use tech tech in the classroom for sure. Trisha? Now I feel kind of inspired. You know, Jeff, you and I were talking about 2024 miniseries for the show. I kind of want to do a miniseries that's called Something Else, where we're sharing, like, what are those relationship prioritizing things that we are Mm -hmm. enabling ourselves to have? It's not just time. You know, I I think we're also talking about the energy because a lot of those tasks, it's not just that it's, you know, it takes me an hour or it's an additional 10 minutes every day. It's also just my energy level, right? Like Mm. I literally can be in a better mood because I haven't had to do some of the less, you know, like sexy, interesting tasks. So I I think um, if we do the Something Else series, uh, you know, Drs. Novak and Rodriguez, like maybe uh, we'll invite you to come and and chat about that as well. What are some of the, because I I think in in the spirit of analogies, our conversation about analogies, you know, I, I recently just had a road trip with my wife and it like really bothers my dad that I always just rely on Google Maps. Like he always thinks like you should have the backup map. And I'm like, the backup map would not help me for a variety of reasons. That's a whole other <laughs> thing. But I'm like the quality of conversation that we can have together because I'm not thinking yeah. about you know, having to know the next 10 directions or, uh, you know, if there's other folks who are map advocates who are really bothered by this, my apologies, but that is something that's taken off my cognitive load and we're sharing stories. We're enjoying the music. I'm enjoying the scenery. 
So I feel like maybe that's an analogy as well. But um, mm, thank that. you. Thank you both it's so much. For, thank you. I feel like as you both have, have created some great analogies, that means a lot to me. Um, in support of students, a leader's guide to equitable MTSS. I read an awful lot of PD books. This has been one of my favorite of the year so far. I really just appreciate how you recognize your educator audience and how you honor them. So folks, links are over there in the show notes to learn more about the book. If you read it, we would love to hear your thoughts on it as well. So you'll find uh, contact information for Jeff and I, or you can send the show a little voice memo to tell us more about your thoughts on the book. Congratulations to you both for putting together just an absolute home run of a resource. Thank you so much much for having us. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'd like to invite you to make a contribution to our podcast community's conversation about it when you head over to camp.shiftingschools.com. Again, that link is over there in the show notes. You can join a community of listeners where we are inviting you to deliver your feedback for you to really respond to some of the key questions here and One of those questions that we are thinking about after this conversation is, as we hope to deliver and cultivate SEL for our young learners, there are some skills that we as school leaders, as educators need to be working on for ourselves. What do you think is one of the most important ones that we need to work on in order to lead for SEL? If you've got thoughts about that question or anything to do with this week's episode, please head over to camp.shiftingschools.com and weigh in. See you again next week.